Thank you for coming. Today, I would like to share with you an important story of Colorado's past. That is the Denver anti-Chinese riot occurring on October 31st, 1880, two days before the presidential election. This local incident, with its unique timing and a political intricacy, contains great national significance. Drawing from my recent book, this talk intends to help us to learn the Colorado history in national context. Here is my story. Sectional conflict is a dominant theme in American history. Since its founding, the United States frequently has to deal with the balance of a political power among the different regions. The continuous struggle of a national principle, political belief, economic interests, and a culture preference produce many significant and fateful events in the nation's past. Of course, sectional conflict continues to exist. On a few occasions, the sectional crisis even threatened the survival of the republic. The best known event is the Civil War. Any changes in political boundary, regional, popular, city, economic structure, and the culture orientation could easily trigger another round of a clash among the competing regions. Each historical period has its glaring issues that have led to memorable episodes centered on sectional conflict in the United States. During the first hundred years after independence, almost all the sectional conflict occurred between the state North versus South. Two major issues crucial to each region's existence, the terror and the slavery, relentlessly drove the principle into fierce political battle. These two sectional concerns, in fact, fueled the three-fifths compromise, Alexander Hamilton's economic program, the Missouri Compromise, the tariff controversy, the bank war, the compromise of 1850, bleeding Kansas, and eventually the Civil War itself. The Westward expansion in the United States also adds a new dimension to this North-South struggle. Each side anxiously looked westward for political allies. As historian Frederick Jackson Turner, the father of the sectional thesis, Perceptively stated, each Atlantic region was in fact engaged in a struggle for power, and the power was to be gained by drawing upon the growing West. In other words, victory in East sectional conflict often depend on winning Western allies. By the mid 19th century, the North had done extremely well in this endeavor gaining sectional partner from the Midwest to the Pacific coast. The Civil War finally gave the resounding victory of the North over the South. This Northern triumph and the subsequent Reconstruction era marks the end of the first period of American sectionalism. When the nation entered its second century, the sectionalism was fundamentally transformed from a two-way rivalry between the North and the South into a three-way competition that now including the rising West, which began to demand a more political power and a national recognition and to try to free itself from Eastern economic and a political domination. By the early 20th century, the West clearly had achieved political equality over the other two regions. Frederick Jackson Turner also acknowledged this seismic shift at the 50th anniversary of the end of the Reconstruction. Quote, in the political history of the United States since 1876, the West has played a leading role, unquote. 
The rise of the West is arguably the most important feature in the second phase in the history of the American sectional conflict. During the rise of the American West, the effort to restrict Chinese immigration unexpectedly emerged as one of the first major political issues to unite the region. Anti-Chinese sentiment offered Westerners a convenient common political cause that attracted a relatively small group of the newcomers who were intent on taking advantage of a thriving nation's economic opportunity. California's gold rush in the mid-19th century had suddenly attracted tens of thousands of the prospectors, including Chinese, from all over the world. From 1852 to 1882, the U.S. government officially recorded the entry of some 200,000 Chinese, equal in 1880 to the entire population of New Hampshire, and the twice the population of Oregon. Branching out from California, Chinese eventually reached every corner of the West. They played a major role in building the region's key as key participants in con the construction of the transcontinental railroad, in the mining gold, and in offering laundry and other service in major cities, and in introducing unique cultural features that to this day help to define the American West. Like other places, Colorado was eager to have its fair share of this valuable labor force. On January 4th, 1870, Governor Edward Moody McCook, in his biannual message to the territorial legislature, formally announced his plan to invite Chinese immigrants to Colorado. Even more surprisingly, the legislature, in a month, matched the governor's plea by passing a joint resolution inviting Chinese immigrants into Colorado territory. Colorado became the only state or territory to make an official invitation to Chinese immigrants. According to available record, the first Chinese arrived in Colorado in 1866. After the completion of the first transcontinental railroad, these 69ers began to follow the track to shine Wyoming, then south to Denver, Colorado. The U.S. Census in 1870 recorded seven Chinese in the entire territory, four residing in Denver. In the next decade, Colorado's Chinese population increased to 612. Rapper County alone claimed 238. Chinese of whom lived in the capital, Kelvin and the Park County each had 124 Chinese. The remaining 126 were scattered around 17 other counties. In Denver in 1880, 98 Chinese clustered on Holiday Street and the other 140 lived between 11 and the 23rd and the Blade and the Welcome Street. Most of them engaged in laundry and other Service. In the first decade of a Chinese appearance in Colorado, the race relations between the white and the Chinese were relatively calm and peaceful. In addition to daily and a common activity, some special events such as Chinese funerals, New Year celebration, and the Fourth of July offer great opportunity for cultural education and the social tolerance. In the 19th century, for example, it almost became it almost became a Western tradition for Chinese to hide a white brass band to lead the Chinese procession. This is the picture taken in them. The Welsh Chinese monarch and the music of the American band together created a theatrical scene for local community. Some band even learn how to play a few Chinese melody for the event. A Chinese funeral was more just a family business. In fact, it became a community event. 
As McQueen once said, in order to know a community, one must observe the style of a few. However, no attempt was excitedly participate in by both the Chinese and the white than the Chinese New Year. Decorate the Chinese houses, exotic food, generous gift, and a splendid firewood. Often attract the many white to Chinatown. Just as the Chinese welcome others to their holiday, white Americans return their courtesy by inviting their Asian neighbors to their festival. In February 1877, Denver held its annual Mardi Gras Gala, which happened to occur on the second day of the Chinese New Year. The local organizers of the event creatively combined the two celebrations, adding a Chinese New Year theme to the Carnival Night Muster. After white went to Chinatown for the celebration during the day, Chinese, including their musical band, went to perform for the others in the evening. This kind of the Chinese white interchange, more or less, contribute to a relatively tolerant racial atmosphere. Nevertheless, an anti-Chinese campaign was brewing in the West. As soon as the Chinese arrived at the Golden Gate, in fact, Anglo-American, out of the fear of economic competition or because of a political ambition, began to call for expulsion of this Chinese stranger. And with this nativist response, California quickly took up the mantles of the anti-Chinese state. Using their local police power, state legislature, and the county and the municipal officials, for example, passed discriminatory anti-Chinese statutes and ordinances. Others targeted the Chinese with illegal vigilante action and the spontaneous mob violence in the concerted effort to effect ethnic subjugation. As it turned out, California setting an example for other Western state and the territory, which soon enact similar anti-Chinese legislation, as well as supported and allowed ethnic violence. Still, although anti-Chinese rhetoric and actions were widespread in the West, there was or initially no formally political campaign to prohibit Asian immigrants from coming to America. For almost a quarter century, California stood alone in the call for national legislation on Chinese exclusion, which gained little political traction on Capitol Hill due to the lack of a Western consensus on the subject. Not until the mid-1870, when Westerners finally lied behind the anti-Chinese settlement due to the growing labor protest, was so-called the Chinese question thrust into the national limelight. More than anything, post Civil War politics helped to transform the anti-Chinese movement from a regional cry into a national brawl. The main reason for this transformation centered on evolving national politics and especially the evolution of the Republican Party. Founded as a sexual political organization, the Republican Party in the 1850s only operate in the North and the West. During the Civil War, however, Lincoln's party, backed by the U.S. troops, triumphantly expanded into the solid South, becoming a national party at the expense of its chief rival, the Democratic Party. But the Republican control of a politics nationwide did not last long. During Reconstruction, Southern Redeemers quickly and effectively drove the Republican to near extinction in the region. Reduced to a sectional party again by the mid-1870, 
the Republicans had no choice but to return to a traditional winning formula based on the North-West alliance. To solidify this alliance in order to maintain their national domination, the Republican Party in 1870 desperately used the bloody shirt strategy by reminding Americans that the Democrats start the Civil War and try to destroy the Union. Such democratic bashing rhetoric did serve the Republican Party well in some elections. But the emerging Chinese question immediately jeopardized this hasty uh, but effective plan for maintaining divisions within the Republican rank along ideological and sectional line. On the West Coast, however, a strong public outcry against the Chinese immediately up and up against the Chinese immigrant and the growing strength of the Democrat forced the Republican Party to come up with a new victory plan to call labor vote, which were crucial in every election. Many Republican candidates and officials willingly endorsed the fledgling anti-Chinese campaign, voicing their support for any discriminatory measures against this minority group. Because of the Republican retreat from its equal rights ideology, Westerners quickly formed the united ground in the anti-Chinese campaign, demanding national legislation restricting the influx of these undesirable immigrants. For the first time, these unscrupulous, opportunistic Western renegades began to challenge the party Eastern dominance, as well as its long-standing values based on equal rights and equal protection, by pushing a sectional agenda to restrict Chinese immigration. The election of 1876 had a tremendous impact on the nation, nationalization of the Chinese question. As the final part of this controversial presidential contest, the Compromise of 1877 officially ended Reconstruction, calling for a temporary truce between the North and the South. Colorado, a newly admitted Western state, commonly passed three decisive votes in support of another four years of a Republican occupation of the White House. Possessing unprecedented political strength, Western suddenly felt more confident about their role in the upcoming years as a power brokers in national politics. A voting bloc of the Western state would get the region even greater recognition. In her classic Chinese immigration, published a century ago, Mary R. Coolidge pointed out that the Western representative from both parties soon found it necessary in order to make any impression in Congress to stand together in all issues involving the state West Rocky Mountain. In the late 1870s, in fact, Western unapologetically unified on the anti-Chinese banner, making a huge push on Capitol Hill to stop the influx of the Chinese coolies and the criminal. The next national election gave the West a golden opportunity to demonstrate its growing political strength. The presidential election of 1880 is not well known in political history because the previous scholars thought it lacked the drama and a broad national significance. Both candidates General Winfield Scott Hancock of Pennsylvania, the Democrat, and the Congressman James A. Garfield, the Republican, were left lusty. Initially, each party struggled to find compelling campaign issues. The Democrat focused on the Grant administration's corruption cases, and the Republican continued to wave the bloody shirt. About two weeks, before the election. However, the nation was hit by a true October surprise.
we just witnessed what? A October surprise. We call the Grammy October surprise. Okay. Brought by the Democratic National Committee, a fabricated letter supposed to have been written by uh, Garfield to Henry Moore of a Connecticut appeared in New York newspaper Truth. <coughs> in the so-called Moore letter, Garfield expressed his opinion in favor of a free importation of 20,000 cheap Chinese laborers by capitalists to New England. A fax file of Moore letter was quickly published in newspaper across the country. And the uh, left was a fabricated letter, the right was uh, Garfield's own writing, published immediately, trying to demonstrate the different handwriting approved. It's a false, the left, right? Garfield, that's my writing. On the left, he even misspelled his own name. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Even though the fake letter, the letter was instantly exposed as a fraud, the political damage to Garfield and the Republican Party has been done. Using the issue of Chinese immigrant question, the Democratic Party intend to rouse the working class everywhere, and in particular to steal the Pacific Coast from the Republican. Suddenly, the whole country was in battle over the Chinese question, and the election seems up for grabs. In Colorado, the Rocky Mountain News, a staunchy Democratic newspaper, had been using the Chinese issue in the local campaign for quite a few weeks. Now, armed with new ammunition, the newspaper viciously attacked the Republican Party, whipping up anti-Chinese feelings among general public. In the meantime, thousands of the recruited Democratic repeat voters from neighboring Wyoming, and New Mexico territory had flooded into Denver, eagerly waiting for November 2nd to cast their ballot. A huge Democratic rally on October 3rd demonstrated the Democratic Colorado <coughs> were wrongly following the party line and faithfully carrying out its national agenda. <coughs> At this point, Denver possessed all the crucial elements for the instigation of the violence. An emotional political issue <coughs> supported by the demagoguery of the press and the unfriendly of travelers, crowd, and an unprepared government. With the right spot, the power can curb blow at any moment. On Sunday morning, October 31st, Two days before the election, about two o'clock <coughs> afternoon, business was as usual at the John Eskerson Saloon near the corner of YZ and the 16th Street. Three regular customers, were white, two Chinese, were quietly playing pool when three or four drunk white came in and began to disrupt the game by removing some of the ball. This provocation immediately led to angry argument with profanity. Since in trouble, Mr. Eskerson, <coughs> the owner of the saloon, calmly advised the Chinese to leave before all hell broke loose. <laughs> Obligingly, the Chinese depart through the back door. A few minutes later, two of the hostiles <laughs> took the same exit into the back alley and saw that one of the Chinese men was still there. One of the white <coughs> men charged him and began punch without warning. Another went back into the saloon to call for help. As soon as everyone rushed out, Asmussen locked the back door to prevent the fracas from spilling into the bar. However, he could hear the sound of the brakes crashing into the clap wall walls in the alleyway. In fact, there was a Chinese London 
in the alley. And the several workers were washing ironing clothes, seeing more Chinese, the white men began to assault London and to smash up the place. And he in self-defense, one of the Chinese instantly grabbed a knife and struck one of the same on the head, making a serious cut on the attacker, who began to bleed profusely. Meanwhile, the host of Chinese who overheard the commotion rushed out from nearby building to assist their country. One Chinese fired a pistol at the attackers, but missed all of them. The belligerent drunk clumsily retreat to the main street and eventually reached 15th Street, where all the bars and the saloon were bustling with the usual sunny buzz. Hearing the Wells of the blood, ruffins, a reduction crowd spilled out into the street. Knowing nothing of the circumstance, the sympathetic room only saw the sight of the bleeding inflicted by the Chinese. When two policemen arrived on the scene, the incensed crowd demanded justice. The policeman asked the wounded man to lead them to the original <coughs> site of the crime scene. Many indignant people decided to accompany the group to the so-called crime scene. Suddenly, shouts of down with the Chinese, and the Chinese must go ran from the crowd as the extemporaneously marched to more fury fiery troublemakers as well as rift spectators. Several hundred people soon gathered at the intersection of Wazi and the 16th Street. The officers quickly transport the Chinese into the city uh, jail at the Laramie and the 14th Street. Disappointed by the excuse of quick exit and a half arm whiskey. The angry crowd instantly turned its vengeance on all the Chinese in the neighborhood. They first launched stones and bricks at the several Chinese shanties behind the American house at the corner of the 16th and the Blake Street. The frightened Chinese, most of whom did not know what had happened, hastily barricaded themselves in, a, in their places the violence had materialized into full-fledged riot, soon to be known as the Denver Anti-Chinese Riot of 1880. Minutes after disturbing mass violence started, a concerned Denver riot ran to the U.S. Mint on Holiday Street and pulled a fire alarm located in the front of the building in second, the hell of the bell on the a uh, towel at the central fire station sent reverberating rain echoes throughout the city. All the city residents had to be trained to think that the fast taping of the bell signaled the Cherry Creek was sending flood waters into the downtown. Everyone rushed into the street to see the expected deluge. Instead, they saw throngs of the people scampering down 16th and 17th Street. Firemen from various stations also converged at the intersection of YZ and the 16th Street, with the hose and the hook. They geared up to put out a fire, immediately realizing they were up against a different kind of a blade. The firefighters connected their hose to the hydrant and aimed the powerful darkness and to the honorary crowd. Arriving on the scene, Mayor Richard Sopris, Sheriff Michael Dunn, the Spang a Spangler, and the Fire Chief George Dunn immediately realized that the crowd had amassed into a dangerous mob. The city of Denver, with a population of nearly 40,000, had an inadequate police force of the 20 officers. 
understand that the amen will undo. Using this, using his instinct as a politician, Richard Mayor Supreme uh, first sought to pacify the crowd with an impassioned speech, asking the crowd to disperse. His goodwill gesture, however, did a little more, did a little more than elicit cheers for Hancock from the crowd, which continued its violent assault on Chinese. Out of a panic, Mayor Supreme ordered the firefighter to spray jets of water at the recalcitrant protesters, knocking down about a dozen of them. Then the firemen raised the angle of the nozzle so they could spray water over the crowd and give everyone a cold shower in the freezing weather. This indiscriminate wash down and many spectators who had on their best Sunday clothes. As a result, even more people took to the street in protest. The uninvited shower turned a curious crowd into a mob of healing, bent on revenge, destruction, and a murder. So insulting and infuriated, <coughs> the inebriate Rome was determined to fire back. A group of Civil War veterans saw a pile of a brick on the sidewalk and they decided to use them as well. In second, they shelled bricks on the unexpected firemen, knocking down half a dozen of them. When the firemen fell back to the intersection of the 16th and the Blake Street to regroup, Mayors of police realized that they had a real right on hand. Passing through the area while running an errand, General David Cook unwittingly ran into the mayor and a fire chief who asked him for help. Cook's heralded reputation as an illustrious frontier lawman gave them hope. A decisive leader. Cook once ordered two deputies to go back to police headquarters to collect all the guns and the club they could find and return to the corner of the 16th and the Blake Street. Cook asked the sheriff with new weapons the squad began to advance toward the crowd. By the time the number of the riders had grown to more than the riot had spread to other parts of the downtown and it eventually covered about the 50 city block. Can you see this? Yeah. By the late afternoon, the mall moved toward the district filled with Chinese laundry, store, and houses on the 17th Blade Holiday Street. Along the way, the riders also attacked and looted some white owned saloon, further lubricating themselves. <laughs> it was impossible a few policemen, two dozen firemen, and a handful of a just <laughs> to control the situation. The first priority for the officers was to protect people from physical harm. They escorted many Chinese to nearby hotels to save a safe heaven. With this club, flying officers fought their way through the gauntlet of the rioters. On many occasions, they had to draw their weapon to stop extremely violent thug. At 4.30 p.m., Judge J. F. Wellman, chairman of the Democratic State Committee, made a sudden appearance on horseback and the bed of the people to go home. Instead, the crowd chanted, Chinese must go, hurrah for Hancock, and Garfield the Chinese. And soon resumed its attack on Chinese home and the business. Before nightfall, the attack had demolished every Chinese property 
on Blake Street. On 17th and the Holiday Street, the riots encountered unexpected resistance from a group of renowned citizens, city's white prosecutors. Madame Litz Preston rushed ten of her walking girls out of the Preston house to rescue four Chinese from further harm. Armed with champagne bottle, five pound, and high heel shoes, these Amazonian beauty formed a firm line of the defense in front of their place. Madame Preston herself stood in the center of the line with a double barrel shotgun pressed against her shoulder. Threatened to shoot the first man who dared cross the sidewalk. At that moment, a blood curling shriek came from the front door of a Preston house. Lucy, a giant African American maid, standing five feet ten inches tall and a weak weighed 170 pounds, jumping through the door, waving a long handled hatchet. Slashing right and left like a mad person, she charged after the right, forcing them to retreat. Her sisters then pulled a few more Chinese into sea. Stunned, riders uh, began to throw stone at the Madame Preston, uh, the brave regiment. One projectile hit the Preston, who stood her ground. Shut down, still aimed at the crowd. Lashing out to protect her boss, Lucy charged into the crowd once again, swinging her head to hew a path. When she reached the stone throw, she angrily struck him twice with the wooden end of the hatchet. That man immediately fell to the ground where he lay unconscious for hours. These brave women, led by Preston, were able to hold their ground until the officers arrived. Later, an officer asked Madame Preston why she had not shot a brick throwing scoundrel. She smiled, whimsically replied, Why, Billy, the damn thing wasn't loaded. <laughs> <laughs> With the help of the officers, the prostitutes carried injured Chinese into the brothel, which turned into a makeshift <coughs> hospital. The brave act of this white prostitute received praise from Demerai. As one person wrote, that day, the prior, the outcast of society, the denizen of the Holiday Street, present himself in the Hall of the Fame. This woman of the underworld proved themselves heroine. Like this cross, many righteous citizens fought hard to rescue and protect the defenseless Chinese. Because it was Sunday, Governor Frederick Pitt was not in his downtown office. After returning to the right, after hearing the right, Governor Pitt rushed to his office on Laramie Street around 5.30. He ordered two or three companies uh, ordered three companies of Denver's National Guard to be ready for action. Nevertheless, the governor showed extraordinary caution in using the state militia because he had been criticized for declaring martial law in Leadville early that year. Because of also the anti Chinese fight in Leadville, he put down the red Leadville, so he was heavily criticized for declaring martial law. The accusing of abuse and no government power. Not until 8 o'clock, after city council's meeting, did the mayor of police finally ask Governor Pickett to deploy guards to the Confederation. By that time, the most of the damage had been done. While the two were waiting in some alleys for final order to advance, the city officials rode around the downtown to give people the last warning. A combination of a continued police pressure and a possible militia action finally broke the will of the riot, who began to disperse. By 10 o'clock, the town had become much quieter. An hour later, 
they will cook the new pastry, which will be glad the wife was old. They took city, please eight hours to quell the wife. Next, the board's task force exhaust policeman and the deputy was to pick up all the Chinese in town and to take them to the company jail for protection. By the dawn on, on November 1st, the police had placed more than 200 Chinese men and women in the county jail for protection. Sporadic violence in the very part of the town continued for a couple more days. In the riot, one Chinese man was killed, several dozen severely injured, and all the Chinese residents and the stores destroyed. The total loss of a property and the personal belongings exceed one hundred thousand dollars, worth about two million dollars today. The riot also created a diplomatic crisis between China and the United States. After the bloody incident, the Chinese consul in San Francisco immediately made a backbiting trip to Denver, where he interviewed several government officials, some white witnesses, and many Chinese victims. Upon receiving a report from the consul, the Chinese minister to Washington sent a formal request of the indemnity to the State Department and to demand federal action in punishing the culprits. Given its own implication of the international law and the treaty, the U.S. flatly rejected reject the Chinese request and never compensate any victim on the ground that it was the state, not the federal government, that should bear responsibility. The intense diplomatic exchange generate more ill feeling between the two countries. The Denver right of 1880 had a great political consequence at home. Although the Morning Left and the Denver right failed to alter the general political map of the Colorado, the Republicans retained their majority in Colorado after the election. It did win California, Nevada, and New Jersey for the Democrats. In New York, Garfield barely won with a 30,000 vote margin. Without New York, Hancock would have won the presidential election. The election map shocked the Republican leader. For the first time since becoming state, California and Nevada favored a Democratic presidential candidate. The Daniel Wright also signaled the Chinese question was no longer just a West Coast issue. The anti-Chinese movement was spreading to the great American West. Colorado could well be the next state to fall into Democratic hands. No Republican leader dare to imagine such a scenario. With the following matter, the Denver riot and the West Coast vote, the election of 1880 became a turning point in the anti-Chinese movement. The restriction of Chinese immigration was to become a part of the national imperative because it might influence national election. And the passage of the Exclusion Act appeared imminent. The Republican Party now considered past such essential its own survival and like the concessions on its principle it had made for the compromise in 1877, gave its support to an act. And uh, limiting the rights of a Chinese immigrant to solve its own internal political problem once for all. Otherwise, you may lose the election in the future because the West revolted against the Republican establishment. After the election, campaign for Chinese exclusion legislation immediately gained traction in the nation's capital.
Garfield's inauguration and the then subsequent shocking assassination in 1881 delayed the legislation, but as soon as the nation recovered from the tragedy, Congress moved quickly, increasing cognizance of the political price for defending Chinese, uh, Chinese. Pragmatic Republicans in the North began to show their willingness to compromise the egalitarian principle in favor of a political alliance with their Western colleague. By withdrawing their stiff resistance to the anti-Chinese exclusion legislation, still this reversal would be an uh, would not be an easy transition because most of the delegates from New England adhere to the sacred principle of equal rights. Consequently, the real fight in Congress over Chinese question occurred among the Republicans themselves, those of the West against those of the Northeast. In this perceived West Coast versus New England conflict, however, no one had anticipated that Republican Senate Henry Taylor of Colorado will make a grand entrance and a delivered a de <coughs> defining and shocking speech in favor of the Chinese exclusion. You look at it just that in time period, Colorado made a shift from inviting Chinese to asking for deportation or exclusion. His extremely strong anti-Chinese language and racist argument draw great attention from his colleagues as well as American people. Taylor's instantly <coughs> became the chief target of Eastern newspaper editors, who described him as a political traitor. The <coughs> Connecticut Current blasted this optimistic Republican for his conversion to the superior race theory. The newspaper show how low Western Republican like Henry Taylor would be willing to compromise the party principle of equal rights for all. Nevertheless, receiving near unanimous vote uh, from the Democrat, the Western Republican easily prevailed in vote to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act. You look at this map. West, right, look at the Democrat, Republicans, or almost unanimous support the Chinese Exclusion Act. And uh, New England vote unanimously opposed because they still adhere to this uh, Republican principle of equal rights. So uh, it passed very easily. President Chester Arthur signed it into law uh, in the spring of 1882. The passage of the Act the watershed in American political history. For the first time, the nation abandoned its free immigration for all people, setting up a present for future race-based immigration legislation. The Republican could no longer universally champion the idea of the equal rights, now collectively deserve the Chinese, like they came to black American just five years earlier with the Compromise of 1877. Jim Crow had found a new home in the American West. As new sectors, as well as ideological compromise, the Chinese Exclusion Act also gave the West its first major victory in national politics. As Connecticut Current instantaneously acknowledged, the solid Pacific Coast has thrust itself aggressively and successfully into national legislation. In the last 50 minutes, I just give you a brief summary of the Denver anti-Chinese riot. What can we learn from this important historical event in making a more racially tolerant society? The United States has suffered from many setbacks and overcome many difficulties. The Denver anti-Chinese right is one of these painful moments. 
the nation during the nation's long struggle for racial equality. Although this right was not blackest one, its deep political intricacy and a profound historical impact surely place it high on the list of a significant historical event regarding two dominant American themes, racial conflict and exceptionalism. Like a very known episode, such as Bleeding Kansas, Hobbs Ferry, and Wounded Knee, the dead of right strikes at the core of the ninth national debate over race and deception in the 19th century. This incident and the, the consequence indicate a correlative relationship between the nation's retreat from the campaign for racial equality and the eminent rise of the American West. This once overlooked event, so reflective of the nation's long struggle for living up to its highest ideal, now has a place in the ongoing narrative of American history. Thank you.
pink pen on Garfield was shot in 18, right after he was elected pretty much. So that's why Arthur signed the bill. Do you think Garfield would have signed it? Uh, Garfield? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but if, if, if he, um, he would have supported the Republican as well, because uh, in the 1880 elections, both major parties put the, this anti Chinese uh, immigration issues into the party platform. Okay, so, we might reach the consent, consensus. Thank you. Yeah. Question. Okay. And Michael's kind of half and half, so I'll get with uh, Larry if he has a microphone for you. What was it? What were the Chinese pathways to becoming citizens? How did they become citizens back then? Oh, it, it, uh, uh, Chinese soon after prohibit Ch Chinese from becoming citizens. That's the very detrimental. Not until the 1940. Uh, Three, the nation repealed, the Roosevelt administration repealed the Chinese food tax, finally they can become a citizen, but still we get Chinese under 105 within the immigration quota. Almost seems significant. But however, many Chinese uh, did become a citizen of the San Francisco earthquake. Why? Because the San Francisco earthquake wiped out the entire town. Earthquake in the two day five, following right? And, uh, everyone feel really bad, right? You think the choice. The Chinese are the only group who feel very good. Right? They destroy all the government documents. After they destroy the document, Chinese, everyone went to the courthouse, declared they were born in Chinatown. <laughs> so you need you need uh, okay, two two minutes. Pay five people five dollars each. Testify. How can you prove it's a fault? Because all the government documents, right? So yeah. So that's why how they become citizens. And then later, by 1940, the government realized, oh, wait a minute. Let's look at the census 1900. How many Chinese women in San Francisco? Then in the last three decades, how many Chinese? Had Central Presbyterian Church in 17 to Sherman. Oh, that, that, that church, okay. That, that church, yes. In my book, I'm, I mentioned that time they, uh, they had to receive the uh, sermon right there, and the minister called all the people attend. That's the law to rescue Chinese. In the book, I'm, I didn't mention that. That's a great Christian name, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. That, 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 yeah. So a lot of Americans they did try to rescue Chinese. Yes. Not all the people, you know, the bad guys. Okay, not all the good people. Well, 
now we know the red light district. If you know that area down on Market Street, it has even more of an interesting history since we know they.